how did you get my name? And then she said, you placed my grandfather. And I said, oh God. <laughs> I said, so I went home and cried. I said, oh. you know, I'm getting referrals from grandchildren. In these 40 years, has this been fixed? Or is no. the hiring process still broken? People are spending money on how to make the high volume process more efficient, not how to make the high touch process more efficient. Uh, and does this job offer you a career move? If we're going to make you an offer for this job, forget the money, Maria, do you really want this job? I call it the 30% solution. We have to give you at least a 30% increase, non-monetary, bigger job, more satisfying, better team, longer term growth. And then we go through all the variables, but the relationship building business. And to me, if I'm affecting as a candidate or a recruiter, I'm affecting the person's life. And I take that seriously. What advice would you give to a founder looking to build their core team? Do not go in your office, walk through your plant. And every time you see a problem with your plant, stop and describe the problem. And you're going to ask the candidate two questions. One question will be is if you were to get this job, how would you fix this problem? The second question is. Quick question. When did you discover that you're a leader? that your actions matter to those that look up to you. You may be an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur, innovating to change the world, or a CEO navigating a crisis, or a parent returning to work and learning to lead your career, your team, your children. There are many faces of leadership, and this is the podcast to explore them all. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm a headhunter and founder of HVO Search, where I help ambitious leaders hire their executive teams. My job today on this show is to help you discover your superpowers, to help you avoid making some of the same mistakes, and to remind you that even if you do, perfection doesn't and shouldn't exist. Thank you so much for listening and please do subscribe and follow this podcast because it really helps others to discover these incredible stories. This show will challenge the way you think and may even change your life. Lou, welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. Thank you so much for coming onto the show. Delighted to be here with you today. Thank you very much for inviting me. Great. Well, you have been in the recruitment industry for what I gather is for over 40 years. <laughs> yeah, I wish you wouldn't have said that. That's actually kind of depressing. So now I'm going to have to take 10 minutes to overcome that reality, but I'll do my best. Well, you might not like one of the questions that might be coming later, but um, but you've, you've invented the performance hiring model. You've amassed a huge following on LinkedIn. You've written several books, one of which I have here, which is called Hire With Your Head. Um, you know, you are, you know, really an expert within recruitment and being a, a headhunter and a recruiter myself, I'm very excited to talk to you and sort of get into the nitty gritty. But before we get started with that, how did you become a recruiter? What got you into this mess, as I yeah, call it? I'll give, you, I'll give you the short story. It was not my life dream to become a recruiter. So at a relatively early age, 31, 32 years old, I was running a manufacturing company. I had 300 people in it. Uh, and every other week, the group president came down. And I hated the group president, and he didn't like me. And we argued every other week. Uh, and I got very depressed, and then I quit. I said, I don't need to deal with you anymore. Leave me alone. Fire me if I screw up, but don't bother me. Uh, and I refused to talk to him. Well, uh, he didn't like that. And I quit four times in that one year. And then I gave him six months' notice and said, I'm really leaving this time. Uh, they kept on talking to me. His boss, the boss's boss, keep brought me back in. But I, since I knew I was going to be, become a recruiter, I just had worked with recruiters early on. So this is like um, 1975, 1976. And I said, wow, that's actually a pretty interesting, they make a lot of money and they don't work that hard. Um, so I'm starting to think about becoming a recruiter. And then when I quit, my wife supported me in that endeavor because I was working 70, 80 hours a week. You, I mean, you're you want to aspire uh, to run a company at 32, um, which I was, it's hard work. I mean, it's not easy. And dealing with this other guy, the president, I said, I can't deal with it. So I did become a recruiter. Uh, and I was actually, if it didn't work, I knew that I could use it to find another job. So that was really the start of it. But when I became a recruiter, so this is the quick connection to the book, 
I realized that hiring could be a business process. I've been manufacturing, finance, accounting, controls, um, planning. I mean, so you look at it, this is kind of dumb. Why do people hire this way? Let's just do it in a logical way. And that eventually became performance-based hiring. It took 10 years to get it to be that, but but that's actually the genesis of it, why I left, how I got into recruiting and how uh, performance-based hiring be, de, was developed. I didn't dream about being a recruiter either. <laughs> I, kind of got, I got recruited into being a recruiter. With regards to creating that process, the performance-based hiring, and in your book, you talk about the hiring process being broken. In which way did you realize that it, it was broken then? Well, first of my first assignment, my first assignment. So I'm going to say I, I quit on December 31st, 1977. But then I had six months to think about getting business. So I had an assignment on January 3rd or 4th, 1978. And it was for a plant manager making automotive components in Southern California, automotive accessories, doesn't matter. Uh, and he said, Lou, good to see you. I'm looking for a plant manager. And that would probably be 150 to 200,000 uh, US dollars in today's uh, comp. Um, and he gave me a job description, handwritten, uh, 10 years experience, engineering degree, industry background, understands these manufacturing processes. And I looked at the president whom I knew. I said, Mike, that's not a job description. That's a person description. This is my first assignment. A job doesn't have skills and experience and competencies. A job is stuff that people need to do. What do you want that person to do to be successful? And he said, I want that person to turn around the manufacturing plant. He said, we're losing money. I think with a good uh, plant manager, we can improve profitability by 10 uh, profit points, 10 uh, uh, margin points. I said, fine, let's go out in the factory and take a look at where that is. So we spent an hour in the factory. We found things that were just looking at them uh, that were obviously wrong the way the material was laid out, the way the factory was laid out, the way the material was purchased, the way the processing was done. He said, I'll find a guy who can do that. And I've never used a job description that lists skills, experience, and competencies since that day. And that's the fundamental problem. I always say, this is not a job description. It's a person description. Let's put this person description in the parking lot. What does success look like on this job? And it's always five to six, maybe eight key performance objectives that define the work, define the task, have some time frame and some metric. And I've been doing that ever since. With that, at least you have a starting point. A host of other things that go after that. But if you don't start with the right job, what are you looking for? You're not, how are you possibly going to uh, find a person who's competent and motivated to do that work? So that was the first step in the whole process. Without that, you're just playing games. You have diversity problems, you have interviewing problems, you have bias problems. But at least if everyone's on the same spec of what you're trying to find, at least you have a solution to all those other issues downstream, including onboarding and including on the job success. So that's the essence of it. And again, I'm going to remind you of how long you've been in the industry. But in these 40 years, has this been fixed or is no. the hiring process still broken? And so why well, do people keep doing it? Well, I think there's, and I'm, I'm doing a podcast next week on how to use chat GBT, you know, the uh, artificial intelligence to do hiring. I'm uh, so excited for that, by the way. Huh? <laughs> I'm very you, excited about you. Are you, are you going to come to that? Sorry? Are you going to come to our book club next week? Yes. Well, oh. if, if I can make it, then yes. I think that well, sounds Okay. Fantastic. Well, let's not, let's not get into that. I thought that I misunderstood what you said. So, uh, yeah, we're using it right now, but... Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to open, I was actually thinking of designing, uh, thinking about the talk last night. So uh, when you really think about it, there are two talent markets. There's more than two, but there's one which is the high volume market. And there's all billions of dollars spent on trying to get people on job boards, uh, assessing people, knock out questions, interviewing questions. And then there's the, I'll call it the low volume, high touch critical position market, which is typical executive recruiter. You're getting paid a 20 to 30% fee or 35% fee. It's a high touch process uh, and it's a totally different process. But, and when you have a, when the demand for talent exceeds the supply, which in most senior staff positions, I mean, you got two to three year level of experience. The, the top 25%, they're always in demand. A three year account, three year marketing person, software, it doesn't matter what the or manager. Once you get two to three years, it's a different way to hire people. And I think no and people are spending money on how to make the, high volume process more efficient, not how to make the high touch process more efficient. Uh, and that's really 
why I think is, the, and everybody, oh, we can hire all these great people. No, you can't. A person who's in the top 25% isn't looking. They need, they might talk to you for one reason, if it's a career move, and they might accept your offer if it's a real good career move, but they're not, they're not just, it's not a transactional process for the best. And I think that's fundamental, the root cause of why um, hiring has been such a problem. Uh, they're going after the wrong talent market. They're thinking people are applying. I said, no, the best people aren't applying. It's a strategic issue. When the demand for talent exceeds the supply of talent, you can't assume uh, that you can uh, you can weed the best people out because the best people aren't applying. So you got to kind of think, well, how do I get the best people? So in a nutshell, that's the root cause of why. And I think chat GBT can help. Uh, and I'm going to say there's another one other great piece of technology in combination with chat GBT and performance-based hiring, and you have a, a game changer. So that's that's my philosophy for 2023 anyway. I, I'm talking about chat GPT, of which I've actually interviewed <laughs> chat GPT on one of the episodes in on the podcast, and um, that was... You very- mean you just typed in the answers or the people yes. who built chat GPT? I'll send it to you. I mean, I'll also link it up here cool. in, the, in the episode. Um, we actually recreated an avatar and visualized it so it was talking back and it was in my likeness and we used the text that was generated by chat gpt with the answers and we're talking about recruitment new year's resolutions like everything it's it's incredible i mean probably not incredible it's unbelievable i mean it's and i think people are afraid of it but the reality of it is if you can as a recruiter if you can leverage it you can just get you can get in the game much quicker you can yeah. become an expert in this job, and uh, so it is remarkable. Well, this morning I was thinking, what can I use ChatGPT to start a new search? And I was like, okay, let's just go and generate a target list of companies. And I loved it. And I was like, all of a sudden, you know, it came up with, you know, a list of, I don't know, 70 companies um, grouped by the the groups that own them. And I was like, this is amazing. This would have, I mean, it's not difficult thing for me to do. It's just much, much faster. Just scratching the surface. Um, So I'm glad that you're talking about that. And I'm really interested to hear how else that could be applied. So, you know, watch this space as well. Well, It might give you you a few tips if you're asked the right questions today. In fact, I'd like to chat with you in addition to some of the other things you've experienced. And that's really the purpose of uh, I'm trying to create a group of people that can really leverage ChatGBT in a lot of different ways. Um, mm-hmm. who are thinking about, hey, let's try to do it. And I think the issue, again, is you're in a high-touch marketplace uh, role. Your job is high-touch. It's not going to – you're going to talk to these people and you're going to present – you're going to do all your, all your due diligence. Most technology doesn't do that. It's very transactional. And I think because of that, job boards in particular, they've cheapened work. Uh, when you really look at the quality of all the money spent over the last 25 years – uh, in job boards and technology and ATS, it's really, uh, I, to me, and it's a waste of money. I mean, nothing better has, it ha- nothing has gotten better. Um, we have an improved quality of hire. The metrics aren't there. We spend more money now to hire the same level of people we've always hired. To me, that's a, a big loser. And I think it's because we've cheapened work with the uh, make it easy for people to leave and we make it easy for companies to post a job and they're satisfied with filling the role, not with hiring a better person for the long term. Well, I think a lot of these are human issues and relationship issues that are not understanding each other. When you're talking about increasing the speed at which people are leaving the workforce or, you know, changing their roles, we're competing with, we're trying to move at the same speed as technology, but we're still human beings. And the relationship part is what we need to be focusing on. And this is both to retain the talent in the first place and two, to understand exactly what's required. Um, and you're right. I mean, sort of at a lower end, you're looking to almost bring in clones as opposed to look for uniqueness and individuality. We were talking about um, recruitment and sort of high touch. And I'd like to make also a distinction between internal recruiters and external recruiters. Do you have an opinion on whether external recruiters, so third parties, you know, executive search, how that compares to internal recruiters. Is one better than the other? Well, I think, so let me make the general statement. We have what's called a recruiter competency model. 
and it kind of grades the 10 key skills that a recruiter needs based on the type of work that they're doing. And if you're a recruiter inside a company, I mean, I don't know if you could, I, when I was a recruiter and I started as contingent and I became a retained recruiter, then I just got tired of it. I just, uh, cause I don't do recruiting. We help companies build recruiting organizations. But if you're as a full-time recruiter, if I was really going to do uh, work and I didn't work that hard, so I don't want to say, but I never took more than six assignments at any one time. I couldn't deal with more than six. Once I got more than six, my performance dropped. I'm just dealing with too much. There's too many issues. But in a it's company, funny you say that because I remember doing the same thing very early in my career, and se- it was the number seven where it was like it was breaking point. Oh, yeah. So, just, yeah. so that to me, that's the right point. Five or six. I have five or six. I mean, you get five or six placements, and you probably close two or three deals a month. That's pretty cool. You're you're very very successful in a company. That's not good enough. You got to deal with fit ten to fifteen to twenty. So even though I can tell a recruiter, we have one 30, 40 recruiters. We tell them and they, and they are actually very good. They could do it. But when you're dealing 10 to 15, you can't do it. You just then become a paper pusher and you're marginally, uh, you're at the margin. You're just basically competent, but not capable of doing the work. So then you say, okay, well, to do better, we'll, ha- we'll make you more efficient. And that, that, that becomes this problem of, okay, we've made hiring a transactional process, not high touch process. So the key core is this high touch relationship building that you need. Um, and if you can't do that, well, then you're out of the game. So is a third party recruiter better than an internal recruiter? Uh, it, it really depends. They, there should be no difference. It just depends on how much workload that they have. So that to me is really the difference. Mm. Yeah, you can't be, you can't do it. So it doesn't matter. So I, uh, so to me, that's really the answer. And nobody's going to pay, uh, uh, drop, you know, triple their size of the recruiting team to do it. So you just got me thinking about my own business and how to pitch it. And actually, that's such a an important insight, which is something that I've kind of known, but never really connected the dots. Because, you know, if you're talking to companies and they're expecting you to do the same kind of work as they do, and if they do volume, they think that it's exactly how it is. And when I'm pitching to clients who they have their own recruitment teams, and actually what you should be pitching is the fact that, you know, they might be completely at capacity. And so they cannot, they cannot do the due diligence that they would if someone else were to take it on board. Um, anyway, this is completely, this is not for the podcast. I'm just there, they're saying this to you. <laughs> we'll kind of like edit. Right, right, yeah of just like just talking out loud and so going back to let's sort of start with the internal recruiters what do the successful ones do differently well i think so i'll say there's probably two things and I, it could be internal or external but if you're working lots of assignments you if you don't know the job i mean I'm, and that's why i say I happened as a recruiter because I have an engineering background. I have a business uh, master's in business. I was in financial planning. I was in engineering design. I was in cost accounting. I was running a manufacturing company. I was in logistics and supply chain. So over the 10 or 11 years I was in industry, I had 10 or 15 different jobs. I had every six or eight months, I said, I'm bored with this. Let me have another. And they gave it to me, which surprised me. They promoted me and gave me a different job just because I asked for it. Uh, But the the success I had was because I really knew the work. So now I go back to a third party recruiter and I assume that you know your job. So even when I asked Mike this question, the president of this company, what does this person need to do and turn around the plant? I knew what a plant, I mean, I've been through, I had been 20, 30, 40 different manufacturing plants. I could walk through that plant and spot if it was a good plant or not. Just look at the floor, look at the machines, look at the statistics. Uh, So I was very comfortable knowing the work. Uh, And I would say in the first 10 years, the jobs that I filled, I knew those jobs. I either knew him personally, I either had somebody report to me, I was one degree of separation from that work. And by asking the right questions, I could very become familiar. So then when I interviewed a candidate, that candidate knew that I knew the job. So now you ask the first question, if you're a recruiter and you don't know the work, you come across as just a paper pusher. So you're a corporate recruiter who doesn't know the work, they don't trust you. And if they don't, the candidate doesn't trust you, you're not going to get any referrals, they're not going to listen to your advice. So you basically become a piece of overhead in the HR department. So that's number one. But if you know the work uh, and uh, you're good at recruiting, 
uh, are good at networking, so you got you can develop candidates quickly. You're in the game. I mean, if you, so, I would say those are the two things. You have to know the job. You have to have a deep network of candidates. So when you get a, a, a search assignment, you can say, okay, let me see how I can connect with a person. Either find that person uh, very, very quickly, or you develop a short list in three to five days. So let me give you a story uh, where I think you'll appreciate this as a recruiter. So this had it. I stopped being a a full-time recruiter, I'm going to say 2005, 2010, right? I still did a few assignments in that period, but very, very few, and probably have only done a dozen since 2010, where before I would do a dozen or more every year. Um, so this is around 2010, 10 or 15 years ago. I get a call from a very nice woman, I guess. Uh, she says, Lou, uh, I am a senior at PricewaterhouseCoopers, and I, in the period from 1985 to 95. 75 or 50 to 60% of my business was only CPAs and financial positions, controllers, managers of accounting, uh, VP finance. So I did a lot of search in that area. So now it's 10 years later, I get a call from a woman, maybe even 15 years later, a nice woman. She said, uh, I'm a price, I'm a price waterhouse cooper. I understand you can get me a job in the uh, entertainment industry in Southern California, Disney, Paramount, Sony, and I place people in all those companies. Uh, but I hadn't done it for 10 or 15 years. Uh, so I'm, I'm, and this was not uncommon in 85 to 95 where I'd get great candidates. I mean, they just called me up and I had a great candidate, make three phone calls. I get him a job. It was pretty cool. Um, but this case was 10 years later. I said, well, I don't do that anymore. Uh, but how did you get my name? And then she said, you placed my grandfather. And I said, Oh God, <laughs> I said, so I went home and cried. I said, oh. you know, I'm getting referrals from grandchildren. Well, it turned out I didn't actually, and I checked it out. I didn't actually place, he was a client of mine. He was a VP finance at some company and I did work with him and place. So I didn't place him, but it was still depressing to say, when you get <laughs> referrals from grandchildren, you kind of know you better hang it up. Uh, so that was a type of network. I mean, I literally, my, I am, my accent, I grew up in New York area, New York city area, but living in Southern California, my voice uh, probably still unique, uh, was I would actually, I can remember there's a couple of CPA firms I couldn't call in because uh, Mr. Adler, we've been, we're not allowed to put you uh, through the connection. This time when they had an operator at the front desk for all these CPA firms, Pricewaterhouse Group or Anderson, whatever it was. So I used to have my secretary call uh, and give a phony name and then they, they so that's how I get in, but that was the issue. So, uh, so I think those two things, you have to know the work and you have to have a deep network. Uh, to me, that's what it takes to be a great recruiter, even in corporate America. But if you're assigned 20 assignments and are all different, you can't develop a deep network, you're, uh, you're just pushing paper. And that's the sad part because that's what really that, and that happens frequently. So are you saying that in order to be a really good recruiter, you should focus very, very specifically on one niche or even like one type of role? Well, yes and no. Um, it's kind of boring to do that, but that's a different issue. But if you're dealing with 10 or 15 assignments, how else could you possibly do it? Uh, if you're dealing with six assignments, uh, then you just have to be good at understanding the work. And that's where I, I started getting into medical device field. So those are, and I had no feeling for those jobs. So I said, okay, I better. So then I learned how to ask a series of questions so that I could talk to the hiring manager and the team and understand the work. So, uh, and because you're not dealing as many, and, but I also learned how to develop a deep network very quickly. So even though I didn't have the network, I learned how to develop it. So uh, so I don't want to say that that's a truism in all situations. Uh, but if you're dealing with a lot of assignments and you want to be very productive, the deep network is helpful. Mm -hmm. And when I was in finance and accounting, literally any job, I could call two or three people and have I could have names and referrals right away. I became that became my understanding the work and developing a deep network became my super skills. Mm. Any assignment in finance and accounting, uh, I could get your candidate in three. And this was, could be a CFO, VP finance of major companies. Then I could find candidates. So it was pretty cool. And then I got bored talking to accountants. <laughs> 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 I talk to accountants for so many, I don't want to talk to another accountant again. So yeah, it's like with, well, with if, if any accountants listen to your podcast, we well, probably just turn them all off. So, <laughs> Talking about questions, 
you promote asking one specific question, which is, you know, in sort of paraphrasing you, it's like, what's the greatest achievement of your career? Um, is that the most important question? And if not, what other questions should you be asking? Well, that's the premise of, so let's assume we're doing this plant manager. And I call you up, Maria, and said, hey, Maria, I'm, look, I got a spot for, uh, and, I, and you're the right candidate for the job. <clears throat> I just say, uh, now I might preface it by saying, hey, I, got a, I have a company that's got 500 people and they need to turn the plant around. Tell me about the biggest thing you've ever done related to that. Well, that's uh, appropriate. So it's a modification of that question. If I tell you, tell me the greatest thing you've ever done, and your question was you created a whole brand for um, uh, some entertain or some uh, fashion industry product, well, obviously that isn't, I can know pretty quickly you're not the right candidate. I probably wouldn't have called you because I would look at your LinkedIn profile and realize you weren't the right candidate. So the idea is when you ask the question, tell me about your most significant career accomplishment of all time, that's pretty revealing. I can spend 10 or 15 minutes it, and I can very quickly determine, are you in the game? Are you even, I mean, are you overqualified or underqualified? Are you in the game? Me asking those questions, uh, and, they're, and it's very uh, conversational. Hey, when did you get that job? How did you get it? Tell me about the team. What was the biggest thing? I mean, there's a lot of fact-finding underneath that. It takes about 10 or 15 minutes to understand a person's accomplishment, but you're proud to talk about it. I mean, if you're in a game, hey, I just, and I, I kind of set it up. This is just a discussion. Uh, what's the biggest thing you've ever accomplished that you're really proud of? And I quickly know if you're, when did you do that? Now you did it 20 years ago. Wow, what do you, that was the biggest thing 20 years ago. Um, then I'm looking at it. But if, no, I did this last year. So if I know if my job's a little bit bigger, I can say, wow, this candidate's, this could be a career move for this candidate. So I very, very quickly know. But I'm, as part of that, I, I kind of say, remember, I took the job as a, when I first went in there, I understand this job as six or eight performance objectives. I'm going to say, Maria, you know, one of the other big things, you got to build a big team. We got a hundred people on the organization, got to reorganize it. Walk me through the biggest team accomplishment you're having building a team like that. So there's a whole sequence of questions that follow up by getting an accomplishment related to each of the key performance objectives of the job. And you don't do it all in one interview and you can divvy those accomplishments up, but I pretty quickly know, um, after I've interviewed the candidate, if this person's competent and motivated to do this work and would they accept the offer because it's a career move, it's a lateral transfer. I'd say, hey, Maria, I love your background. <laughs> You're great. This is too, not a big enough job for you. At best is lateral transfer. But because I've spent time with you, I, and I also I'm going to connect with you on LinkedIn and I can search on your connections on LinkedIn. Hey, what do you think about this person and this person for this job? Oh, you know those person? People know, but I can see that you're connected to them. Um, so now I can get a referral uh, either the next day or during that conversation. So it's a pretty powerful question. And then, and candidates, when they're asked that, they love to talk about it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm willing to listen to them and I'm fascinated by what people have accomplished. So it, to me, I actually do get interested. Uh, and they say, well, this, you're not the typical interviewer or recruiter, are you? No, I want to know if you can do the work and if you're interested in it. So, uh, mm. so I ask, why'd you like it? How'd you get the assignment? Would you do different if you could do it over again? I mean, it's, it's a fun conversation, but uh, they recognize that um, I'm doing my due diligence on both sides. Yeah, it's it's interesting that you you start with that question. And on what do you know that I start with? Well, let's say this: I do ask it pretty quickly, but I don't know that I start with it. But no, so. I mean you want to kind of build a bit of a rapport rather than just like going straight in there. But the the reason why I'm 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 asking is because in the last six months, I started doing something similar. And this was before I read your book, because the way that I have been trained to interview people is to kind of start at the beginning and, you know, go through the whole of the experience. And that takes a long time. You know, it takes a long time for somebody to sort of build up to grading uh, to some degree. So. So the reason why I started asking this question is because I got lazy, <laughs> or at least I thought, because I wanted to just get straight to the good stuff and, you know, then kind of go back and, you know, if I need to ask the questions around other areas. Yeah. So, yeah, I was very pleased to to read that and to to find out about, like, your technique about it. So, yeah, it definitely works. It opens the conversation much better to the things that you want to know that right. are relevant to the role yeah say it's a founder of a company that doesn't have the resources they don't have internal hr they may not even have 
the full sort of C-suite um, in the business. What advice would you give to maybe a founder looking to build their core team? Well, maybe I'll give you a story. I don't know that it totally relates to that, but it's comparable. So, and this is probably about 20 years ago. Part of the marketing that I did for my company, which really put us on the map, and I had, it wasn't my idea, it was my next door neighbor. I don't know if you're familiar with Young Presidents Organization or Vistage, which are, uh, it's a business, they're business groups of CEOs get together once a month. So my next door neighbor said, Lou, would you like to uh, talk to YPO, Young Presidents or this group? I said, I'd be happy to. Uh, so this was like 1990. Uh, my first talk I don't know if you've ever been to Southern California. My first talk, the president of In-N-Out Burger was there, which is a big uh, cult burger chain in the West Coast. He said, Lou, I love your thing. Can you find me a CFO? My first retained search. We gave 400 presentations to business groups uh, in the next 10 years. And it was just the greatest marketing technique of all. Because I'm talking with people who have hiring needs. And I tell I've got a two-hour talk. And 90% of the time, I got search assignments after each talk. So it was just unbelievable. So I could cherry pick the assignments I wanted. Uh, and then we started creating these performance-based job descriptions. But there was after one of these talks, and this was probably 10, 15, 20 years ago now, I get a call from a founder of a company, small company, and he says, Lou, what are the two questions you have to ask? There was actually two questions you asked me, Maria. One of them was what I told you, but I'll tell you the other one now. And I said, well, I, I, it doesn't matter what the questions are. I got to know what the job is. I said, tell me the question. And this is a founder yell, almost yelling at me. I don't know this guy. And he's yelling, I need the questions. I need the questions. And he was obviously in the meeting. And I said, I, what are you looking for? He said, a VP operations for my company that's making wood products. I said, well, when I just come out, and it was about an hour, uh, from, but it was a search, full search assignment. So it was a, would have been a, a big job. Uh, I said, why don't I just come out and I learn it? I'll, I'll do the whole thing with you. He said, I need the questions right now. I said, why? He said, the candidate's in the hallway. I said, ah. <laughs> so he had already, so I said, let's do this. I said, tell me, just uh, give me a five minute walk of what the job is. And it was a manufacturing plant again. I said, so here's what I want you to do. Do not go in your office, go in the manufacturing. And this is a founder. I said, walk through your plant. And every time you see, a problem with your plant, stop. A problem that you want fixed. Uh, and describe the problem. And you're going to ask the candidate two questions. One question will be is, if you were to get this job, how would you fix this problem? The second question is, and spend 10 minutes on doing that. And then the second question is, what have you done that's most comparable, which is the most significant accomplishment question? Okay, here's a problem. And one of the problems was, um, and he just said, I got so much wood scrap. I mean, he was making wood products, but 50%, he said, a third of our wood we throw away. We got to redesign everything. So, uh, so I just said, well, ask a question, describe the problem, ask the candidate how uh, he would fix it. And it was a, a guy he was interviewing. And then uh, ask him if he had done anything similar. So we, I said, then call me uh, when you're done. I said, it should take me an hour and a half to do that tour. He calls me about three hours later. He said, Lou, Great interview questions. Great questions. He said, uh, the guy told me how he would solve the problem, and he was he was brilliant at telling me how to solve it. But when I asked him what he had done that was similar, he couldn't. He had no, he had never done anything similar. So I got the idea. He was a great consultant, but not a hands-on operations guy. Why don't you come out tomorrow, and we'll and I we got the search. Went out tomorrow, and I got the search. But so the idea of a founder is if you know the the work. You just, and even if you don't know it, you have to say, hey, candidate, and I don't know this job. Uh, what do I need to know to pull that off? I mean, you could just get into that game of, uh, but the, the issue is, is what's your problem? Ask the candidate to tell them, and you don't need to always ask, how would you solve it? But said, what have you done that's most similar? And if you were to get this job, how would you solve it? That's the problem solving question. We call it the anchor and visualize. The ability to visualize a solution plus a track record of doing something similar is a high predictor of success. One without the other is a high predictor of failure. It's got to be similar in terms of pace, complexity, decision-making, size of the team. It doesn't have to be identical. It has, and, that, and that's really the issue is some founder, oh, i got to have someone with exactly that. No, you have to have someone who can think in that environment and done something comparable 
but if it doesn't have to be identical. And that's that's sometimes a problem is people, oh, I need 10 years experience. No, you need enough experience to do the work. And it might be in a slightly different industry. So so many, so many companies have these, this is what I need to have. And now they prevent diversity. They prevent thinking differently. They, yeah, they have a, a problem that's reasonably complicated. And I don't want to minimize that. But the reality is it doesn't have to be identical. It just has to be comparable. And uh, that's where people, if you're, if you're a good manager, you can t- you'll take the risk of, yeah, this person's smart enough to handle a complex, similar complex problem with similar people in a similar environment. Well, I guarantee that if they've done all that, they'll be successful and if, they, if they're motivated and they can work with you. And, and in our search firm, Maria, we placed, well, more than 1,000, but I remember the 10-year period, we placed about 1,000 people. Uh, maybe 800, six or 800, but it was a lot of people. And we tracked, and we had a one-year guarantee. Uh, so we started tracking what people failed over a 10-year period. And our, we had a one-year guarantee. Was how many times did we have to fulfill that guarantee? And it was like 70, 80, it was like 7 or 8 to 10%. It was less than 10%. But when we dug in the less than 10% of why they failed, maybe two or three Less than one percent was lack of technical competency. It was always the relationship with the hiring manager. I would say two thirds of it was that. Other one was the person didn't like the work, not motivated. But the managerial fit was the biggest one. Uh, they just clashed with the hiring, and that was I go back to my own. That's why I clashed. I loved the work I had. I wouldn't have become a recruiter if that uh, president. And they they actually said, "Lou, we'll keep you and we'll uh, we'll we'll fire the group president." They had he had other problems. It wasn't just me. But they weren't. He was on a contract, so they weren't going to fire him for two years. I said, I can't deal with him for two years. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but so I, I know that that's an issue. One thing that you talked about is, you know, this less than seven percent, and majority of the time it's to do with the relationship between the hiring manager. I mean, the clients, me, talk about culture fit all the time, and it's such an intangible thing. And partly, you know, matching a person to another environment and another people is trying to figure out both. What's the culture of the business and what's the culture of this person? Question number one is, what do you think culture fit is? And then two, how do you figure out whether there is a match between those two? Oh, yeah. So let's say this. No, When you give a year guarantee, you become very religious in terms of I don't want to do this search over again, as you know. You don't want to do oh, God. No, I kind of this was, very, very was miserable, very miserable the first time. Why would you want to do it again? Uh, uh, so, but very critical, knowing that you know that you have to do it, you figure out. Well, one way to measure culture, and I'll call them proxies for culture, and you'll get this in the third part of the book. The last third of the book, we get into this. So it's, you'll find it there when you read it tomorrow or whenever you read it, Maria. Um, one is the pace of the organization. You know, entrepreneurial startup companies, rapid pace, little infrastructure, making decisions on the fly. Uh, so I just ask questions and, hey, in that big accomplishment, Maria, uh, what was the pace like? What was the intensity like? Did you have enough resources? Walk me through how the big, what was the biggest decision you made and how was it made? Were you frustrated by that? Did you like it? So I'm starting to get a sense of uh, the pace of the organization, the process, the level of sophistication, the depth of resources, and how comfortable the candidate is in that kind of environment. And I'm mapping it to the environment that, of my client. So that, that's one way to do it. But there's also a thing on what I call managerial fit, which is the most intangible. I actually think the culture, people can define it. we got good policies, all that. Maybe. I don't care about that. I guess if you can deal in the pace and the decision-making and the politics of that organization, they're pretty, you can transfer that to another organization. The hiring manager, though, that's the day-to-day. To me, that's the dominant culture. So I'm looking at, so when I ask you the most significant accomplishment question as a candidate, Maria, tell me about, what was the hiring, you know, that's a pretty major accomplishment. What role did the hire, what was your hiring manager like? What role did that person play in your success? How much did you, did that person coach you and how did they, where did, how did they delegate? So I'm getting a sense of in every accomplishment, the role the hiring manager played in that accomplishment and the type of manager that where you excelled. So I've asked this most significant accomplishment question three or four times. So I'm getting a real sense of uh, your work environment, your pace, who you work with. So now I also know the hiring manager and my client. uh, And I've interviewed that person. Uh, And I know if they're dominant and in your face and uh, direct, that could be a problem. If I know they're a micromanager, uh, uh, then I know that can also be a problem. 
put it, most managers are coaches, delegators. Some of them want more experience, want less experience. Some are willing to coach and train. But I'm asking those questions when I take the search assignment as well to understand. Uh, and I asked the hiring manager, if you're the hiring manager, Marie, I said, tell me about the, your best people you work for. What kind of people do you like to work for? So as part of that, I'm trying to understand uh, how much independence you're going to give, how much controlling you're going to give, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, that's still not, I'm still, background, as you can tell, Marie, I still am an engineer. I mean, down deep, that's what I am. And I, uh, so I really look at that thing. That one is a tough one to design. It's still there. It's still human nature. I try to get close. Uh, and then we've worked at it, uh, but it's still not perfect because the situation under stress, things change. Um, you change, companies change, and I can't take every single environment and understand it, but I try to do the best I can. And then on the other hand, I want to close this deal and I might, I know the candidate might not be perfect. Uh, I'm going to kind of ignore stuff. Who, that is I so? Who is like, there's no such thing. There's no such thing yeah. as the perfect person. Right. But so, I like what you said about um, asking the question of, you know, who was the manager under whom you have thrived? And I think that is really interesting because I ask, like, who is the person that you enjoyed working with the most? Question, and I right. think which is similar, but I think the, the thriving part, I think, is even more um, critical because you might not even necessarily, you probably end up liking them because everybody enjoys being successful. Um, but I think those qualities of where you perform the best and how does that manager influence that? And I think that's, that's, that's really good. Yeah. Um, talking about, you know, some of the things have not been successful. What has been your biggest flop failure where you thought, actually, this has not worked out? Well, in the dot-com boom, probably when you were a teenager or less, maybe a toddler, uh, which is 20 plus years ago, I knew I had the solution. I knew performance-based hiring would work. So I started a dot-com and it was an abject failure. I mean, I raised about $3 million, put another million of my own in, and it um, it failed. It was a total failure uh, uh, because it wasn't, it, although the concept was right, implementing the concept was challenging. As I look at chat GBT, a lot of what we thought about was that. We said we, we created wizards for a lot of this stuff. Um, okay, if you ask this question, what answer would you get? We had like pick one of the 10. It, we didn't, uh, it was obviously 20 years ago. It wasn't the same. But we said, okay, if you're building a job description, pick one from column A. What do you want this? And what was the team like? So it was kind of hokey, but uh, it didn't work. So it didn't matter. Um, and then ATSs were coming out. So that in terms of a failure, that was it. We've never been able to scale it. This is such a personal process of building uh, a touchy-feely process because you're affecting a person's life. We have a training company. People would think of it, but people don't want it. They want to do fast and quick and high volume and scale it and scale it and scale it. Um, so that would I would say that's a difficult process to get to. You can write the books, can do it. People conceptually look at it and say, I want to try it, but then they get the pushback from the hiring manager. And uh, we've had success where the company, where a hiring manager says, we're going to do it um, this way, uh, or HR or a VP or a president says, we're going to do it this way. But uh, it more often reverts to the old way of doing things and the biases prevail. Do you think it was timing at the time? Uh yeah, it was also a bad strategy. I mean, different now. Yeah, I would think if it was going to be today, I probably now I see chat, I see LinkedIn. Uh, there was a chance back in, um, I don't want to say 20 years ago, where we had very serious conversations with a couple of ATSs. I won't tell you the names of them, very, very serious. And then the dot com boom, and everyone says, nah, we're not spending money. We just got to close down. Uh, so there was a chance that if we built this, into an ATS system at the time, uh, it could have been effective. There are a couple of ATS systems, ISOMs, uh, Greenhouse, and if you're familiar with them, uh, where they've incorporated bits and pieces of it, but their models of an ATS applicant tracking system is manage a lots of candidates who've applied versus a few candidates who are qualified. Uh, so the, the model is they're going after a high volume fill, fill jobs quickly model versus let's raise the talent bar model. And when you have those two competing uh, objectives, it uh, becomes difficult to win. Now, looking to the future, what's the future of recruitment? 
Well, I've looked to the future, so I'm going to go. I got kicked out of a bunch of conferences, um, and I, I don't know if you – there's other people who are my age, <clears throat> and we were in a conference. Uh, I don't I, – you know, I can't remember the conference. It was 10 or 12 years ago, and uh, those four of us were also the pun, supposed pundits of the industry. And that question that you just asked, Maria, was the question, what's the future of industry? And then John Sullivan and Kevin Wheeler and somebody else, Jerry Crispin might have been, it doesn't matter, all people my age. Uh, and they all pronounced this, what sounded profound and articulate. That's ah, a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> it's not going to change. Uh, it's not, nothing's going to change. I don't know that. It, so I'm a total cynic with respect to that, Maria. Uh, I think there are tools available. Uh, LinkedIn recruiter being one of them. But LinkedIn recruiter, recruiter, when you look at LinkedIn by itself, in my mind, the value of it, it's a network of 800 million people, not a database. And most recruiters think, I got to find the right candidate. My, my first question is, no, I got to find someone who knows the candidate to get a referral. Uh, so I just don't think that way. I don't need a candidate. I need somebody to give me a referral. If I, either I know the person directly, so they'll call me, or I got to get a referral from somebody so it becomes a warm acquaintance. So I'm constantly thinking as a recruiter is I got to develop connections quickly and it can't be transactional. Uh, and I'm looking at LinkedIn recruiter for this uh, little webcast I'm doing next week. And I saw some great candidates and in there it says recruiters don't call me. Uh, but I called this one guy I said, Hey, Bill Smith suggested I call you. Oh, how's Bill doing? It was a referral to the same guy, but on his profile, it says, do not call me as a recruiter. So when you go with cold connection versus a warm connection, and to me, if, if I had to just look at that simple little piece of knowledge or logic, it's, uh, and until they break that bridge, nothing's going to happen. And, to, and candidates are thinking the money's most important. No, the career is most important. So everybody is just focused on day one, not year one. And not, so I think, so I'm, that's where I say I'm a cynic. I don't, the future isn't until you uh, start thinking long-term uh, as opposed to what the compensation package is, the work, it's not going to change. People are still going to cheapen work and try to make this a high volume transactional process. And success for the top 25% is a slower process. Well, I don't know. It has to be slower. You work with, you spend more time with fewer people. You still can get this uh, search done. And, you know, you, I mean, if you really know what you're doing uh, and you have a deep network, you can get candidates in three to four weeks and close the deal in a month uh, or two months. Uh, which is how long it takes to close when you do transactionally. So I think it's thinking it differently. Sorry for that long-winded answer, but it's, it's one I've pondered over many, many years, long before you were born. <laughs> <laughs> it's something that I think about a lot in terms of what, you know, how, how the industry is changing. What do I need to do to keep up with it? You know, how is AI going to you know, shift it? And I agree with you. I think it's, it's very difficult to create a technology or you know or, or to even do it faster because we're still human beings that rely on relationships and understanding of each other and as far as I know the technology we have doesn't really have that and when you're talking about being able to you know call 10 people and then have your long list and create a short list out of that that's you know that's an incredible thing that you have developed over years and years and years and that becomes more valuable um than something that can give you you know just you know regurgitate and give you a thousand people because you know with with linkedin i think about well what did i and i'm not as young as you think i am i used to when i started there wasn't linkedin and i used yeah, to have that, to go to okay. a library to look through books oh, I, look I remember those days <laughs> So LinkedIn massively changed how we look for people. And while you think, well, everyone's, you know, pretty much everybody's there, all you have to do is just find them. It's a lot harder now to have that conversation or to be visible to, you know, get attention because there's just like so much being bombarded at people. So how do you cut through the noise? And I think that's where excellent recruiters with excellent relationships, that's when they really, truly shine. Well, that's what I said when I saw this one guy and it was just uh, and in, I'm doing a case study for this webcast and it was for mid-level software developers. So I went to chat GBT. I said, what would that? So I, and I, I really used chat to really get in the game quickly. But then I said, OK, I need a list of candidates for this job. Uh, and I used the approach of I'm searching on my connections, connections. So there's one candidate and it really looks like the best candidate. We went through the search and 
really look like the best candidate. They said, this guy looks great. And it says, recruiters do not call. But the reality of it is, if I called the person who he used to work for, whom I knew personally, and said it, it was only a case study, so I didn't do it. But I know if I got this guy, Bill, uh, to open the door for me, he absolutely would call me. But I think that's the what you just said right there is uh, it's a relation. For the top 25% of people who are looking for careers, it, changing jobs is a major career decision that you don't do casually. For, 50, for the person who's looking for a job as a transaction, it doesn't matter. It's a very impersonal process. And then the results of the, and then you have quiet quitting, then you have underperformance, dissatisfaction. Uh, so you, it, what market are you dealing with? And when you're dealing high volume, it becomes in, uh, very transactional. And you can go all the knockout questions, all the tests, et cetera, et cetera. But you're thinking of the end game is I want a, a person to, and I call it win-win hiring. Uh, when I call a candidate up, I said, Maria, if I was going to hire you for this job, success in my mind is a year after you start. You can he hear the dog. That's a uh, call. <laughs> <laughs> we got five minutes. I think my wife's going to keep next year. Uh, I call it win-win hiring. Win-win hiring means a year from now, after you start, a year after you accept an offer, I call you up and you say you're still delighted with that job. And I call the hiring manager and say, still delighted they hire you. That is a hard decision to get to, Maria. But if we engage in this conversation, that's the goal. It will be time consuming. It will take more time, but it will be a right decision. I recognize our compensation has to be very, very competitive. It might not be the best, but it'll be close. But more importantly, we'll be giving you the best career move. And I would like to begin that conversation with you to see if that makes sense. Are you open to that? And I, so I sell the conversation, not the job. I don't know if it's a good job or not. How could I possibly make that statement? That would be presumptuous on my part. Uh, just, uh, but the idea is that, oh, and so when people, now you got to recognize that I got your name because someone, even though I don't know you personally, we have one common connection. You are a, a warm connection by, because I got your name through some referral of some type. Uh, so that kind of starts the game. But normally if I didn't have that, you wouldn't even have called me to, the candidate wouldn't have called in, to set the stage to begin with. So there's a lot of, I pre-qualify everybody I call in some way and try to get a connection. So I don't spend a lot of time. I, I got eight to 10 candidates I'm going after and I'm going to, four or five will be perfect and they're not, they're going to give me two or three referrals and I'm in the game here. But mm -hmm. it's a relationship building business. And to me, if I'm affecting as a candidate or a recruiter, I'm affecting the person's life and I take that seriously. A selfish question. How do I become a better recruiter? Well, it depends on, I don't know how, I can't answer that because I don't know how good you are now. Uh, so that would be, again, presumptuous on my part. I would probably, uh, I mean, let's say, say, say this, a lot of recruiters were listening. I would say, well, if you don't know the job, that's the first thing. Number two is when I conduct an interview, I'm actually conducting due diligence. I'm understanding where you are in your career, what's important, where you've been successful. So I'm looking at, can I, does this job offer you a career move? I call it the 30% solution. I say, Maria, before, uh, if we're going to make you an offer for this job, uh, three or four days before I make you this offer, I'm going to say, forget the money, Maria. Do you really want this job? And it's nothing to do with the money. It's what you're going to be doing. And I, I call it the 30% solution. We have to give you at least a 30% increase, non-monetary, bigger job, more satisfying, a better team, longer term growth. And then we go through all the variables. But the idea is those are what's important long term. I recognize to get in the game, uh, the compensation has to be competitive or else we don't even have a, we can't even start. But let's assume uh, that's the case. And then we'll go from there. So that to me is uh, understanding the job, being a good interviewer, to me is the, the key. Uh, obviously, you got to find good candidates. So that's another part of the key. So that's why I, say I can't uh, say what you need to do to be a good recruiter. The other part is you got to get good assignments too. I mean, you got a bunch of dirt ball assignments. Well, so bad. So bad. That's why I say this marketing approach that my neighbor gave me was pretty cool. I mean, I give him full credit for it. Um, he got me into this and got lots of, it grew my business as a result of just being able to speak to these business groups. So it was a, a really cool situation. I saw a post on your LinkedIn from a couple of days ago, and it was looking at how do you decide whether you leave or stay in your job. And I like mm -hmm. the way that you kind of created these areas to look into, you know, the job satisfaction itself, you know, kind of taking compensation completely out of it, you know, who, who you're working with, the, the manager, the stretch in your job. And I, I think that's 
a brilliant way of looking at it and deciding whether even any other opportunity that comes your way, whether that's worth it. And when you're talking about that 30% that it needs to be improved, that then you was, need to look at all of the areas. Right. There's yeah. those components of it. Basically, it was so the genesis of that to give people background is this was probably just before Christmas. Uh, somebody on LinkedIn said, should I quit my job? So I knew I had this little uh, graphic that showed the components of a great job, the compensation package, the hiring manager, the job itself, the company, uh, the work-life balance, um, the long-term growth opportunity. So I just said, so I said, rank each of those six factors on a one to five scale. And if the total isn't at least 12 to 13, which two and a half would be 15 is an average job. Um, you should leave. Uh, I mean, he's just not going anywhere. He's just going to be plodding along. On the other hand, don't accept the job unless the total scores above 20. And it was a pretty dis quick decision uh, to make. You just have to look at your job. And if it's going nowhere, yeah, you should leave, but don't take, don't just take it to relieve short-term pain. Uh, really look at it to balance the short-term needs and your long-term growth opportunity. And that was really what the graphic kind of describes to do. And in some way, I do that every single time I present, I uh, try to place a candidate. I said, do you want this job? And I always ask candidates. So this is from a recruiter. Compare, in comparison to other jobs, how would you rank this job on a scale of zero to 10 in comparison to everything else you're looking at? A 10 means you just want it. Six or seven, you're interested, but not great. Five is a waste of time. But most people say a seven or eight. And I said, what does it take to be one point better? Well, this will be the best career, the best job amongst everything else you're looking at. And that uncovers everything. You know, it's not enough growth. I don't like this. I mean, so the, I, as a recruiter, have to close the deal. I said, well, right, let me see if I can get you that information uh, to see if we can make this best on your list. So, I mean, a lot of it is solution selling, which is uh, what it takes to be a good recruiter. You have to understand your product and you have to understand the buyer. And in this case, you have two buyers, company and the candidate and the candidate's family, all the advisors that will advise the candidate. So you're dealing with a pretty complex uh, situation. Uh, it involves a lot of human nature and uh, human emotion. I think that's a great idea. And actually, I'm going to steal that from you and Go do that with my candidates. I think that, that's <laughs> great. Rather than just looking at people who potentially are considering and coaching them, that actually apply that to the search and, you know, um, getting the candidates to see whether it's something that they want to take. So uh, thank you for that. No and um, how did you grow your LinkedIn presence? Please tell me your secrets. No, I, I tell you. Again, it was, I just lucked out. It was not, <coughs> excuse me. That's like uh, one and a half million followers. That's amazing. That's a lot, but I don't think I have that many. But um, so this was when LinkedIn started their influencer program, which was 2014. I happened, LinkedIn was a client. So we were doing a lot of training at LinkedIn. Um, and I got LinkedIn because I did some training at Yahoo and as an engineer, it doesn't matter. But uh, so then I, but I was training the marketing group. And the marketing group at LinkedIn said, Lou, we're starting this influencer. I know you've written a lot of books. How would you like to be one of our first 50 influencers? I said, of course. I, again, I had nothing to do with it. I just was happened to be there at the right time. And they said, we'll get, make sure you have at least 100, a million followers in two years. I said, it's fine. Good deal. <laughs> I mean, it was obviously a no brainer that I just said, just write one or two articles a month and uh, we'll put you on our influencer program. So they only had 50 influencers at the time. Then they increase it to 100. But I was one of the first 50. But again, it was because I knew the head of marketing of the group who was running that program. And I it was and I, I like I give my neighbor this success. Yeah, I think our product was good. Um, but he was the guy who came up with the idea of getting me in front of these groups to speak it. Uh, this guy, Francois, was the head of marketing at LinkedIn at the time. He was the guy who said, I'll, OK, I'm, it's my program. I'll put you in there. So mm -hmm. Yes, I think my content was good, but it was really just being at the right place at the right time. So that's really the secret. Yeah, well, connections, knowledge, and kind of linking all of the dots. Yeah, right. And it's also being at the right place at the right time. Mm. Well, Lou, thank you so much. It's been fascinating speaking with you. I know you've got to get going, but I mean, it's I could talk to you. My dog, right. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, really appreciate you coming onto the show. Thank you very much, Maria. Happy to be here. Hopefully this was helpful and uh, good luck to everything you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me here on Anatomy of a Leader. What did you discover in this episode? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments on YouTube or reviews on Apple Podcasts. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe or follow buttons and I'll see you next week.